Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for coming, and welcome to the Cambridge Union. Uh, for those of you who haven't been here before, welcome, and uh, I hope you're looking forward to what promises to be a fantastic event. Uh, for those of you who have been here before or are our members, welcome back. Uh, this evening, we are welcoming Dr. Kaifu Lee. Uh, Dr. Lee is chairman and CEO of Sinovation Ventures and president of their Artificial Intelligence Institute, managing a $1.8 billion dual currency investment fund. They focus on developing the next generation of Chinese high tech companies. Prior to founding Sinovation Ventures in 2009, Dr. Lee was the vice president of Google and president of Google China. So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Lee. Thank you very much. It's a distinct pleasure to be here speaking at Cambridge. Uh, I'm going to tell you a few words about my company, and then I'm going to launch into my talk about artificial intelligence. So, okay. So my talk is on my AI journey. I, my company is called Sanovation Ventures. Some of you know I used to work for Microsoft, Apple, and Google. Uh, um, about eight and a half years ago, I started a company called Sanovation Ventures. So can we click? Ah. Okay, so we're rated as the number one VC firm in China, manage about uh, $2 billion, and um, we're one of the top three unicorn makers in the world with offices in uh, China and the United States. And we're not only a VC, but we're also an AI institute. That is, we're creating artificial intelligence companies in areas of retail, medicine, and so on. Uh, we invest in artificial intelligence, but also other areas like business to business, education, digital entertainment, consumption upgrade. So that's all I'm gonna say about my company. Those of you who are interested, feel free to contact me or email me or my colleagues. But what I wanna really talk about today is my own journey into AI. I was very fortunate to have been exposed to AI 35 years ago when I was a student, like many of you, at Columbia University. I decided to apply to Carnegie Mellon and this is actually a yellowed paper I found um, in, in my storage that talked about my belief that AI is the study of the human cognition process, that if we could figure out AI, we could understand how people think, and this was going to be uh, my aspiration and hopefully something that I could give, I, I could do, and uh, change the world. This was the way I felt 35 years ago. And I was fortunate to have been admitted by Carnegie Mellon and developed the first uh, computer program that be the world champion. Uh, not Go, but Othello, a much simpler, humble game. Uh, but nevertheless, we beat the world champion and also developed the first speaker independent speech recognition system uh, as my PhD thesis in 1988. Uh, and then we made that into a product at Apple. So if you use Siri today, that team is uh, developed by many of my former uh, employees and students. So very, very uh, proud of the legacy and very fortunate to have been involved in AI earlier. But AI really didn't, um, didn't emerge as an instant winner. Uh, at first, when I started, many of my colleagues were saying, well, AI means we should figure out how people think. So we think in terms of if this, then that, and else that, can we program that? That was the expert system approach. People had high hopes, but it really didn't scale. And then people thought, well, it's a statistical problem. You show it a lot of data, and that should work. But then again, people felt that didn't work. So for two times already, uh, it's gone through the oh my God, it's going to destroy the world, and no, not at all. And now we're now at the third hype. Uh, everyone's talking about um, AI uh, becoming so smart again, uh, and is this time going to be different? And 
and today I'm going to talk about the, um, well, okay, click too much. So is today going to be different? Uh, and my answer is today will be different. We're not going to have a huge bubble. And that's because there has been at least one very big breakthrough called deep learning. Uh, many of you are familiar with that? Maybe not, I'll give a very simple introduction. Deep learning is a very big network uh, and it's trained on a huge amount of data. And it, is, it works like a spreadsheet in the sense that if you um, fill in lots of details, like um, let's say you're a company with a, um, each person's salary, earnings, taxes, revenue, uh, and so on, and you click, your quarterly earnings comes out. It's like magic. And deep learning is like that, except that you feed it faces and it comes out and says, this is Kai Food and that's John. Or you feed it with go positions. It says, ah, move here or move there. Or you feed it with uh, some people's financial records and it says, safe to give a loan, not safe to give a loan. So that is like a fancy spreadsheet. Except that uh, uh, deep learning, unlike spreadsheets, you don't have to program it. It's programmed automatically by presenting samples of data. So by presenting lots of people who defaulted on the loan and lots of people who paid back on the loan, it learns uh, what's the kind of people you can make a loan to that's unlikely to default. By teaching it winning goal positions and losing goal positions, it learns how to make more positions, that, more moves that lead to win, winning positions. So that's the basics of how deep learning works. And the idea of deep learning applied to specific domains, such as face recognition, speech recognition, um, and playing Go, is you're generally called weak AI. That means you pick one area in which you present lots of data, and it gets better than people in making classification or decisions. Some people talk a lot about strong AI, meaning AI doing everything humans can do and more. But that today is a fantasy. There's no engineering possibility that we can see for someone to construct in the next decade a system that is strong AI. We see that in science fiction, but it really is that. It is just fiction. Now, is it possible 100 years, 200 years from now? Perhaps, but I think today we have some great opportunities and pressing problems, even with weak AI. So we should focus this talk and most of our energy on the weak AI. Because the weak AIs have become so good that on issues such as uh, smart city, self-driving, voices, robotics, voice recognition, and doing books, accountants, uh, customer service, telemarketing, uh, machines have already begun to exceed human performance. So rather than thinking about a possible, unlikely but possible future where the singularity occurs and machines become so smart, let us focus on what happens when all these tools become pervasive and human jobs are replaced and human we and wealth is created uh, because of the capabilities of AI. So um, let, me now, let me now move on and talk about um, the four waves of artificial intelligence. So we generally talk about AI as one thing, but actually AI is m multiple in waves. So if you could let me show me the picture with the four waves. All right. Uh, there are four waves of AI, the first of which is, can be called Internet Data AI. And that is because AI is fueled by huge amounts of data, and it learns on data to make strong predictions. So who has the most data? Well, it's the Google, Amazon, Facebook, and in China, the Baidu, Tencent, Alibaba, that have the most data. And every day, we are contributing data as we browse uh, search with Google, buy things with uh, Amazon, and, and we're also labeling for these internet companies. And what does labeling mean? When I go to an Amazon page and decide to buy, versus you who went to the same page and decided not to buy, it's teaching Amazon what type of a person uh, that's more like me 
that's more likely to buy, and that's less like you, who's less likely to buy. So when more people like me come around, it will put this as a recommended um, possible item you could look at. So internet companies accumulate huge amounts of data. Every day through usage, we're labeling the data, so that creates the first set of most powerful internet uh, AI companies. The second wave of AI is applied to business problems. So that is a bank, or perhaps um, a hospital, or an insurance company that has data that it previously archived, with, not with the expectation of using it for AI, but uh, perhaps for archiving, safekeeping, accounting, monthly statements. But all of a sudden, um, with AI technologies, these banks and insurance companies can use AI to fit into its business process and do great things for, for the bank. For example, decide whether this credit card use is potentially fraudulent. Decide whether to give you a loan or not. So to give some examples, uh, we have uh, funded a company that's doing uh, a loan assessment, whether someone's likely to repay a loan or not. And that company is able to process 30 million loans per year. So think about how many people it would take to do that. And it has a much lower default rate than humans. So that's a perfect example of a, a first generation um, uh, AI, AI product. Uh, in terms of um, uh, the second generation business commercial AI, AI, I'll give you the example of a, another company we funded that is doing customer service. So it collects the logs of all the previous customer service, as well as whether the customer service representative helped the user get what he or she wanted based on their uh, feedback. And by watching enough of these transactions, which good companies often keep for the purpose of improving customer satisfaction, uh, the computer learns to have a dialogue with the person in a way that satisfies and answers the person's problem. It's using text, not speech at this time, but the level of satisfaction, the level of um, accuracy in determining and pinpointing the user's question is at 95% higher than human customer service reps. So think of this as going to um, your bank's website and saying, um, uh, I want to deposit a foreign check, how do I do that? Or you mischarged me for a credit card, I want to um, uh, have you reverse the charges and have the system understand that that's what you wanted. So that's the second layer of commercial AI, and that's going to create a lot of applications. The third layer of AI is what we call perception AI. That is, now AI is not just data that's stored in some archive, but the computer can now see and hear. And it's actually digitizing the physical data in, in data with data that didn't exist before. Think about this room equipped with video cameras able to observe everybody's um, attentiveness, uh, puzzledness, uh, disagreement, or falling asleep. <laughs> uh, imagine if this were an elementary school where the student's um, uh, progress can be tracked. Imagine if this were a retail store where each person picking up a merchandise and buying and not buying becomes captured and that offline data can be used just like online data to make strong predictions. So this world where everything is now digitized and then combined with online and offline is the third wave uh, that will happen. Uh, those of you who've heard about Amazon Go is an example. A company we fund called Face++ is doing the world's best face recognition. Uh, they can in fact recognize faces from three million people. So imagine airports that are with cameras uh, scanning every person who walks in that will effectively prevent any terrorists from entering a plane. So that's the power of this kind of AI. And then finally, the fourth layer, probably what we hear the most about and think about AI, is when it's fully automated. So a, a robot, an industrial robot, a commercial robot, uh, a home robot, uh, doing services for us that uh, can be done better than people. That is a little tricky because now you're dealing with mechanical 
uh, control and not just with software. But nevertheless, we have invested in companies that in agricultural AI that picks strawberries, in commercial AI that, that wash dishes, uh, not like a, a dishwasher, but it really washes dishes like, from throw everything in and everything comes out clean, all the dishes. The, uh, it does cost $300,000, so, so not ready for your home use, but it's a great commercial use because it can replace five dishwashers. And uh, in industrial robotics, uh, um, Foxconn is one of our partners, and for inspecting the iPhone and for assembling the product, increasingly that will be automated. And of course, in autonomous vehicles, which we all hear about, so I don't need to say more about that, that's going to be a huge advance. And when that happens, 10% of human time becomes freed up because none of us will have to drive again. So these four waves of AI will happen in parallel and create a lot of opportunities, a lot of wealth. And how much wealth will it create? Uh, PwC estimates, I purposely used PwC because I'm always an optimist and I want to give you the most pessimistic conservative numbers <laughs> from uh, uh, accountants. So they believe uh, for China it would be about $7 trillion uh, in the next 12 years. And for the world, it would be something like $20 trillion. So that wealth is created from more, more accurate uh, loans and deposits and investments, from smart stores, from smart schools, from autonomous vehicles, from uh, industrial, commercial, and uh, home robotics. That will free us up, give us a lot of free time back. Um, so that is the huge upside of AI. It's, transform it's transformative in creating a huge amount of wealth, and it's transformative in potentially creating in so much wealth that we might be able to dramatically reduce or even re eradicate uh, hunger and poverty from the world. So that is a wonderful thing. But every wonderful thing has a flip side, because in every function that I described, there is also potentially tasks of human jobs that are replaced by AI. So we can see here that for many of the routine jobs, AI will, could replace and surpass people who perform repetitive tasks, such as telesales, customer service, um, and uh, tellers, uh, receptionists, and then in the five-year time frame, in about maybe 10-year time frame, uh, traders, reporters, assistants, security guards, analysts, and maybe more in the 15-year time frame, uh, uh, drivers, and potentially even going into very complex high-end jobs such as radiologists. Anybody here studying to be a radiologist? <laughs> time to think about another major. <laughs> So what should we do if we're a radiologist major, radiology major? Well, you can go into research. That's the kind of thing that AI cannot do. Uh, you can use AI as a tool. You can create new things. So on the right side, you see a bunch of jobs that may be amplified because of AI, because AI can be a tool. And the future doctor can use AI to more accurately diagnose and help patients, where the uh, diagnosis, the logical diagnosis is AI tool's job, but connecting with the patient is the doctor's job. So that symbiosis would be a very good thing. And many other professions on the right, uh, going from uh, the arts to history to liberal arts to uh, science to engineering to um, CEOs and venture capitalists, those jobs cannot be replaced. But the left side is a pretty dangerous and large percentage. So if human race faces as many as 50% of the jobs that might be replaced by AI, that's certainly something for us to be concerned about. What's another big concern? It's a widening gap between the haves and the have-nots. The left graph here shows you uh, the United, in the United States, the top 10th percentile and the uh, 90th percentile income widening and that's before AI comes into being. When you consider uh, Mark Zuckerberg, Larry, Sergey, and the next 1,000 AI billionaires, 
and the people whose jobs were replaced by AI, you can see those two curves diverging even further. So that's going to potentially cause a lot of concerns and social instability. So what I want to talk about is now is how do we deal with that imminent danger? Okay, there are economists who tell us, don't worry, uh, every technology revolution has always ended up with more jobs created than it displaced. But I would argue this time is different because AI is transformative at every single job level. It will replace every routine job. Unlike the Industrial Revolution, the steam engine, electricity, those were less pervasive and those were, um, took a longer period of time because it took longer to put the electrical grid um, on, on the face of the earth. But AI can be operational today. So I would not be so quick to follow the smart economists in saying there's not a problem. Uh, even the economists acknowledge that 50% of the job tasks are likely to be replaced in the next 15 to 20 years. So even the jobs are not gone, many of the tasks, which could be 20, 50, 70% of a job, uh, those will be replaced. And, and even the most um, optimistic economist would concede that uh, average wage will go down. People's work hours will have to be reduced. And that really put even the, that most optimistic view poses a big challenge for mankind because from the industrial age, we have been brainwashed to believe in the so-called work ethic. That means if we work hard, we will be rewarded with wealth, respect, and dignity. And maybe buy a house and car, and our kids can have good education, like you guys here. And that is something most of the world operates on. If all of a sudden you pull the rug from under the world and say, oh, uh, never mind that, uh, even though if you work hard, you can uh, get wealth and dignity, but your repetitive job is no longer needed. Humans need not apply because robots can do a better job. And imagine what kind of disappointment, disillusionment, and um, uh, challenges and social, dis uh, social instability might result. So I would pose in front of you that the largest challenge for AI is not dystopia. It's not AI taking over the world, but rather AI taking, but rather specific AI taking specific job tasks that causes many people to lose their jobs, have to work fewer hours, taking less money, and feeling a lower degree of satisfaction or even disillusionment in the world. And when that happens to 50% of the population in the next 15 years, I think that is a huge problem. So what do we do about that? And let me now relate back to my personal story. I have been the poster child of the industrial age work ethic. These are the three books I have written, uh, and they represent what I've always believed in, that if you work hard, you can be the best that you can be, and you can make a huge difference and change the world and technology will change the world. I know some Chinese friends here may have read my books in your, what is it, elementary school? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the left one when you were uh, maybe 10, and then the middle one when you were 18, and then the last one uh, just this year. Uh, I was so proud of my own work ethic, uh, I had the nickname of uh, the Iron Man, because at work, I would respond to email on a five-minute basis, and even during the night, Anita's nodding because she's one of the victims of my work uh, ethics. Uh, even at night, um, from, uh, after I go to sleep, I respond to email within two, two and a half hours. So how do I do that? Uh, I, had it, I had my biological clock trained that I would wake up at two o'clock every morning and then go answer all my emails. Then I go back to sleep and then wake up again at five and answer all my emails. And this is a very, very unhealthy habit. But to me, I felt like, hey, when I work for Google, I could talk to uh, California, talk to uh, uh, people. I could answer emails on demand. Uh, my employees will think I'm a hard worker. Then they'll work hard too. This is all great. 
um, actually not so great because of what happened next. Uh, about four years ago, I was discovered to have fourth stage lymphoma. And that made me completely rethink about my life's priorities. Uh, before, I was proud to be the Iron Man, uh, but then I realized when I looked at death in its face, that maybe I had only months to live, I immediately uh, came to tears and started to realize my priorities were all wrong. That the first thing I did was write my will, and that took me a long time, because, but I had to do that because I had to face the possibility I might not be here uh, that much longer. Uh, next is a, um, many months of regret. Regret that's very well captured in a book called The Top Five Regrets for the Dying by Bronnie Ware. Uh, she was a um, 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 caretaker nurse that took care of thousands of people, over 2,000 people, and then she heard people in dying bed uh, saying what they wish they had done with their lives. And the top wish that people wished for was to spend more time with their loved ones. And then it was that time that I realized my priorities were upside down. Uh, my father had passed away when I've never told him I loved him. My mother had lost her memory so I could be with her but not really communicate with her. Um, my wife and family, I spent time with them, but really uh, only enough to get by, and not with the kind of uh, sincerity and depth that would make me uh, feel like I've done my duty as a father, husband, and child. So with these regrets, I came to realize that if I, were, I could be cured, I need to live my life differently. That life isn't about the industrial age work ethic. Life isn't about running like a clockwork, being an Iron Man, and proving you can uh, work so hard. But life has to be about something that's different. And my epiphany is that I've, I've understood that from the l biggest number one dying wish uh, is that we are here, we humans are on this earth, we cannot possibly be here to repetitively, routinely do more work and fulfill the industrial age work ethic. The reason we are here is because we have loved ones, that we want to spread our love around, we want to um, give love back, we want to pay it forward, we want to treat those who are dear to our hearts, we want to be nice to people who are our relatives and friends, but we want to really love the whole world. And the best feeling is, is when you see a newborn child or love at first sight uh, or um, the happiness in your mother's eyes. These are the moments that we treasure and these are the moments that we wish we had uh, when we start to look at death in the face. So this was my epiphany and I decided to live my life differently. I would still work hard but give higher priority to my family to my friends, uh, I would think about empathy, compassion, and helping other people, because this is the kind of work that not only makes my life more meaningful, but I think is why we are around, uh, why the Maker made us in, into, this, into this world. And also, it gives us a great degree of satisfaction, that even if someone says you're going to make less money, but you could um, share your love, I would say it's worth it. So coming back to our AI problem, this may be the solution. Uh, there are really two things AI cannot do. I talked about the creativity part, but the other part is that AI does not know how to love and care. We saw in the Kejie competition with uh, AlphaGo, uh, I would say most of the almost all the Chinese were rooting for Kejie because the moment that he came to tears, people saw that this is someone with emotion. He loved the game. He cared deeply about the game. And AlphaGo beat Kejie, but it had no joy from winning, um, and it had no desire to hug a loved one after it won. And that is what's different between the cold machine, which has no feeling and no compassion from a human being. And I also realized that if we were to make a great doctor, 
that is AI, we would not want to have the pure robot doctor talk to the patients because I can imagine a patient going to a doctor, a robot doctor, and getting the prognosis that you have fourth stage lymphoma and uh, just uh, three years to live. That would be almost like a death pro pronouncement that would dramatically reduce the patient's confidence and chance for recovery. Instead, the doctor should be a human who gets to peek into this wonderful screen that suggests all the questions you can ask and all the things you can, uh, all the symptoms you can try to tease out, and then the human will wrap its own compassion to make the patient feel better. The, the doctor should care about every symptom. They should converse a lot with each patient and not just see them for three minutes. If they did have fourth this stage lymphoma, the doctor should say something like, oh, you have the same thing Kai-Fu Lee had and he is already better. So go through his regimen of chemo chemotherapy and target therapy and you should have a chance too. You know, we all know that human body works in mysterious ways. The very fact that there is a placebo effect means that there is something mysterious that if people give us hope that we can recover, uh, we're more likely to. So a, a, a cold robot doctor can never do that. So this li the, herein lies the answer to what to do, is that we, are, we cannot hope that AI will create the jobs that it displaces and everything works out magically. We, the humans, have to create jobs that will, create, that will be interesting, uh, fun, uh, gives you high degree of uh, satisfaction and dignity, and also economically meaningful so that you can make a good living with it. So whether it is uh, becoming a um, fun tour guide or a wonderful concierge or a caretaker, um, or someone who just talks to people in the elderly home or orphanage and keep them company. These are jobs that are worth creating. So we should think more about solving the AI job problem, not so much by saying, oh, technology will take care of it, or everybody should become a creative, because not everybody can, but rather think about service jobs, jobs of compassion, jobs that people, you can imagine, Someone might, instead of working 60 hours a week, they might work 30. Instead of going to a factory uh, to assemble parts, they might go to an elderly home. They might be helping an elderly person um, get washed and clean, feed them, talk to them, keep them company. And after 30 hours a week on the weekend, uh, they can enjoy their hobby and reflect upon the 30 hours in which they made people's lives better. So that, I think, is the way in which we can transition the society and move people to jobs of meaning and jobs of compassion. So if we look at a future blueprint, yes, the big blue circle is AI. It is our tool. It will help us do things more efficiently. It will give us a lot of time back. Um, there will be a small number of creative jobs, the Olive Circle, uh, that will use the tool to, to do creative things and generate the greatest economic value. But there will also need to be a large group of pink, compassionate jobs where people connect to each other and generate and create a lot of positive energy. And that is the path that I believe we as humankind have to move forward to. The solution to AI taking away jobs is not to create more AI or to let AI create more jobs, but that we as people have to realize what it is that's deep in our humanity that, is, uh, that will give us satisfaction and make the world a better place. So tracing back to my 35-year-ago PhD thesis, uh, PhD application, I realized that I actually went after something uh, totally wrong. At the time, I thought artificial intelligence would be to pursue uh, the understanding of human brain, but really by understanding how to solve the AI job problem and having gone through my own uh, trials and tribulation, I realized that the most important organ we have is really not our brain, uh, but our heart. Thank you.
thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lee. That was fantastic, and I learned a lot <laughs> uh, from that as somebody who knew very little before. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions uh, first, and then we'll open up to questions from the audience. Uh, but before we do, I want to go back a little bit into the past um, and look at your time before you started Sinovation mm. with Google, Microsoft, Apple, etc. Okay. What did you kind of take from those businesses, huge multinational companies, whether it be the culture, the technology, etc., um, into your own business? And what did you leave behind? What was the good bit and what was the bad bit? Uh, I think having had the fortune of working at three amazing companies, I learned that there is no such thing as the so-called Silicon Valley culture. Every company has its culture, and uh, the things that you can learn individually are very, very different. Uh, from Microsoft, I saw the um, a massive number of people can that can create the most complex machinery. That's something that I learned that was important. Uh, from, from Apple, I learned the deep um, love and care for what users want. Uh, that's more important than anything else. And then from Google, I learned that um, a company of small teams of very high IQ people can really do magic in the internet age. So these are the kinds of things I learned. So when you go out and seek your jobs, don't just go for the big brand and think they're all equivalent because each of the culture I talked about may be suitable for someone uh, different. Now, why did I do Sinovation? Um, I saw eight and a half years ago that China was undergoing huge changes, that a generation after generation of entrepreneurs are going to show the world uh, that China can be the most innovative and entrepreneurial people uh, Chinese can be the most innovative and entrepreneurial people in the world, and that I thought I had something to give to help that happen. And if we look at today, eight and a half years later, and you look at the companies that have grown and succeeded, and the, the, how China in the last eight and a half years, certainly not through our doing, but we were a catalyst in, in, in helping, uh, China has gone from a copycat country into a country with a lot of um, a brilliant new business innovations that we're very, very proud of. If you think about a lot of the new companies emerging from China, we were at New York Times yesterday, and then they asked us to describe some companies. Uh, we talked about live streaming, we talked about Toutiao, we talked about Kuaishou, we talked about shared bicycles, and then they said, can you explain how any of this works? This is all like brand new to us. So I think you know, that's what uh, innovation means. I, I think China has unique characteristics in having a huge amount of data, a very supportive government for innovation, and a large number of very dedicated people. And it was a very interesting confluence that I felt like it was time to leave the multinationals and be able to help the young people uh, realize their potential. Okay. I suppose one of the dangers people do talk about is not just that AI will replace jobs, which obviously is a concern, but also that AI, by its very name, can learn itself mm. and can learn not only the positive side and can learn how to complete <coughs> tasks more efficiently or learn how to recognize faces and voices, but it can also learn to actually survive for itself and with that can learn the bad things that come with it. Is that a danger that people still understand? Is it something that's just in movies, or is it real? Uh, today, it's just in movies. Okay. Um, <laughs> as, you know, I think people like to superimpose our own greatest fears and greatest desires mm. onto machines. And, and if you think about the human learning process through the last, you know, ever since you know, there was Earth, how our DNAs have evolved yeah. towards today, it's really for one goal, that is to survive as a human race, right? Uh, not only do our DNAs, but also the fact we walk on two legs, we've learned to, uh, to fight back, we found fire, and the fact that we've created institutions like religion, marriage, um, jobs, are all ways to ensure that we human race survive. And we feel so strongly about that desire to survive, we superimpose and transfer it to machines, which have absolutely no such desire. Uh, machines are just tools 
we give it, we, we optimize it. So we basically tell it, uh, minimize the error rate, uh, maximize, uh, maximize the return on investment, uh, minimize, <coughs> minimize the default rate. So we give it specific numeric goals and it learns to optimize them and it has no uh, happiness or when it succeeds, no sadness when it fails, and certainly no desire to, 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 to survive and extend its, um, its, its life. Now, having said that, can we guarantee that it will never gain self-consciousness, that it will never um, you know, do cross-domain common sense reasoning understanding? Um, it can never have creativity. It can never have feelings and compassion. No, we, we can't guarantee that. Uh, that's what breakthroughs are for. But if we really look at how many breakthroughs there are, see, there are people who claim so-called singularity. And what that means is uh, because progress in AI has been so fast that one day it'll just tip and every, it'll become super, super smart. But that is a faulty argument because that presumes not just a um, um, growth of data and growth of applications. It also presumes a growth of breakthrough innovations. So if we really look back at the last, uh, AI was founded in 1956, okay, so the last um, 62 years, uh, there's been really just one innovation that is at a breakthrough level quality, and that's deep learning. And yes, there are a lot of other things that have potential, but nothing yet. So if we had to project what are the sets of huge problems that have to be overcome by breakthroughs? Uh, there are things like uh, multi-domain reasoning, learning on smaller amounts of data, learning to generalize. Uh, there are things uh, be beyond that, like um, uh, uh, common sense reasoning, understanding of natural language, uh, understanding across any domain, ability to make inferences, ability to, to plan. And then beyond that, there is uh, your feeling, compassion, self-awareness. So each of these will require one or five or 10 breakthroughs. So we're like 100 breakthroughs away <laughs> from achieving that. And in the last 50, 60, uh, two years, we've had one breakthrough. So to extrapolate and say, oh, in the next couple of years, we'll have a, uh, artificial general intelligence, I think is just way uh, over-optimistic and naive. Uh, so I, I don't rule it out someday, but yeah. I think it's a long, long time from now. Okay, and surely with each breakthrough and each innovation that requires a new platform, you know, when everything becomes more complex, a new sort of computer platform or something is required. Yeah. Does that mean there are also computer science innovations that have to come with it to support it, like quantum computing and those sort of things as well? <clears throat> yeah. Yes, I think there's a, clearly a software platform, yeah. and then there are hardware platforms. Uh, just like for PC, there was Windows and Intel. Yeah. Um, for, um, for mobile, there is uh, Android, iOS, and, and ARM, <laughs> right? You <Yeah>. guys. <laughs> yeah, ARM and, uh, and Qualcomm, right? Yeah. So uh, what is the platform going to be for AI? Uh, I think at the software level, certainly Google has the best shot. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Google's product is called TensorFlow. And then to, even to the last two days, they announced some capabilities that allow non-programmers to start to use it. And I think that's a big, big deal. Uh, underneath, I think currently NVIDIA uh, with its GPU is the leading platform. Mm -hmm. But there are many people who are trying to disrupt and invent new things. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But today, I think Google and NVIDIA appear to be the big winners in providing these uh, platforms. Okay. Um, looking at China as, it, as a business market, yeah. you know, AI is one thing, but also as its own emerging market. Yeah. Do you think more generally that China now has emerged, or do you think it can now, you know, can it now be seen <coughs> as a parallel economy with places across the West, of the, the rest of the world? Uh, or is it uh, AI or in general? In general, um, so tech. Yeah. Because I'm yeah. yeah yeah I'm not okay. So in tech, <coughs> I think there are uh, several important reasons why China has emerged. Mm -hmm. uh, in some areas of tech, like AI, I know more and I have more confidence. Uh, I think there are a couple of main reasons. Um, I think one reason is a great number of overseas talent returning. Because okay. Chinese universities are still well behind um, mm -hmm. US and UK. But look at how many you're training here. 
and, and you go to MIT, Caltech, and Stanford, CMU, you'll see the same number. I think overseas Chinese trained and returning is a huge powerful force, yeah. um, and, and some with a lot of experience. Uh, number two is a very hardworking young group of um, engineers and, and, and technology innovators and entrepreneurs uh, who are very hungry. Number three is a very strong VC ecosystem. That is, an entrepreneur can get the money and then it is, they do a good job, there's a next investor, next investor, then there's a public market. That actually is an area where UK is not nearly as strong as US or China. Um, the fourth reason is a huge amount of data. Uh, and that's, data is the fuel for AI, and China has more data than anywhere else. Um, and, and some of it is, is uh, it's not just three, you know, people say that China has three times more users than the US, but it's actually way more than that. Um, for example, China's most amazing development in the last uh, four or five years is the creation of a mobile payment system. And, and, and if you go to China, you'll see that people don't, don't have cash and they don't have credit cards. And uh, by using mobile pay at, with no commission, peer to peer, any one of the 600 million people to anyone else, um, and, and uh, with no, no commission, and it's instantaneous, um, that I think is transforming um, uh, entrepreneurial opportunities, technology opportunities. You can't, you know, shared bicycles would only be possible if you have such mobile payment. So, and that is also a huge amount of data, as I mm -hmm. was saying. Uh, that, that amount of data is 50 times more than the United States. It's not three times difference. And then the last reason is a government push. Uh, the Chinese government, I think, puts very high priority um, on AI, uh, fairly high priority on pharmaceutical bio, fairly high priority on semiconductor, and, and, and it puts a lot of cash and resources behind making these things possible. So I think with these uh, confluence, this will uh, push China forward as more of a leader, especially in engineering-oriented technologies. Mm. In sciences, it, it still may require more, more uh, out-of-the-box breakthrough. I think where China still falls way behind is in the education area. Uh, and I usually contrast with the US, but I think it's equally valid with UK. Uh, the quality of professors, the quality of the education institution um, is, is actually probably the most sustainable and powerful differentiator uh, that U.S. and U.K. have. Mm -hmm. And that China will probably take at least 50 years to catch up. But all the other things bode well so that despite the education uh, deficit, and because of the graciousness of Cambridge and other schools in helping to train the, the Chinese students, uh, I think uh, uh, things look very, very uh, promising and rosy for China. Yeah, that's great. And uh, my final question is, tomorrow night we're having a debate here mm. on driverless cars, ah. autonomous driving. And um, the actual motion is called, This House Fears the Mass Adoption of Driverless Cars. Mm. Just wondering what your opinion is on that. A fierce meaning is is afraid of how kind of pervasive they will become, mm. and not only how they might replace jobs, but the potential danger of yeah. hacking or yeah. over you yeah. know, consciousness, etc. Right. Uh, I, I I think there are usually several things brought up. Jobs we already covered. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, the sa the second thing is um, is, th is uh, security. Mm. And uh, as a number of uh, famous driverless car researchers have said, when you have a driverless car, it is by definition a weapon because it can be remotely hacked and terrible things can happen. Uh, when, when especially you can imagine two countries at war and one country mm -hmm. controls all the cars in the other <laughs> country, <laughs> how scary that is that we're not talking about battlefields and weapons. So I think coming up with um, invulnerable capabilities is, is paramount to the adoption of driverless cars, and, and we should all work really hard on that. Uh, there is a third issue that comes up a lot, which is um, when, when is it safe enough to launch? Uh, there are cautious companies and people 
who would argue you have to be 10 times better than people because lives are too precious to, to lose. Um, and then the other camp would say, well, as long as you're a little bit better than the human, launch it um, because you're saving lives overall, right? Let's say, um, and then there are also uh, questions like the trolley problem. Uh, when an AI algorithm faces, uh, I'll, I'll make this really, really hard. So I, the typical Charlie problem is not very interesting. I'll make it really hard. Uh, which, if you are an auto, uh, autonomous vehicle and uh, you're for, you, you have no, you've run out of road, you must do, there are only two things you could do. One is uh, kill one person with 100% certainty. The other is kill two people with 51% certainty each. Uh, which one do you do? That kind of moral dilemma question can draw a lot of interesting ethical questions and debate. And I'm not gonna answer them <laughs> here, but I would, I would say, on the average, uh, the Chinese government, and I personally, take more of a techno-utilitarian techno approach, which says we have to obviously be responsible and not cause more lives to be lost when we launch, but you have to have faith that AI algorithms with more data will improve. So that if when launched, it's um, um, the deaths may go from X to 0.99X, so only slightly lower. But with more data accumulated, in five years, it might go to 0.5X. Maybe in 10 years, it might go to 0.1X. Maybe in 20 years, it will go to 0.00001X. How does it do that? Because on that day, um, humans will be outlawed from driving. Uh, that, that is, I think, the uh, eventuality of autonomous vehicle. Assuming we overcome the security questions by accumulating more and more data and then by having the cars communicate with each other, like, I have a flat tire, be careful around <laughs> me, uh, using IoT and car-to-car -car autonomous, uh, uh, car-to-car uh, networks, uh, they, and, and also, with amazing precision, with high-definition maps, uh, two cars will just miss each other by half a centimeter, and no human can drive with that precision. So I think if we take a techno-utilitarian approach, we get the product going, uh, iterate, make it better, and then it will talk to each other and become a world that is uh, safe and efficient one day. Thank you. Um, I'd like to open up questions to the audience. Uh, the way this will work is, if you'd like to ask a question, please put your hand up and wait for one of our stewards <coughs> in the yellow jackets to bring a microphone, um, and then you can ask your question. Yes, he's just here. Please, can you wait for a microphone? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Kai Fu Lee, and my, I'm a first year Cambridge mathematical student, and I really enjoy your speech today, and I would like I would like to ask a quite technical question today, <laughs> and is that uh, opt optimization is a very popular research interest several, maybe decades ago, and uh, the president of Chinese mathematical society called Yuan Yaxiang also research, have some research in that area. But these days, as you said, deep learning is very popular now, and is quite different from optimization which is that you need to, for optimization, you need to create something to make the algorithm better, but for deep learning, it actually learns by itself. It, so it's quite different. So my question is, so what do you think whether the optimization, the research will fade away in the future, or mm -hmm. there will be a totally revolu different revolution of that? I see. Okay. Uh, yeah, I use the word optimization much more loosely. I use it to mean um, getting towards a particular goal or an objective function. So in the deep learning, it's not magical. Human still has to stipulate a, an objective function. And that objective function is then trained on large amounts of data to, to, to so quote unquote optimize the, the outcome. And, and I think that is now the uh, the de facto preferred way to solve most problems. Uh, you may be referring to more operations research where it's still solved formulaically. I think over time, um, uh, more data-driven approaches uh, like deep learning uh, will be the way to go. Uh, and very interesting thing is that m in most domains, uh, people find that 
uh, not overlayering it with human knowledge is actually a better way to go. Uh, so you actually train it with the outcomes that you desire. Uh, for example, you don't teach a loan underwriting program with what a human loan officer thinks you should give the money or not. You train it on the actual outcome of whether the loan was returned or not. So I think, I think deep learning gives us a very direct route to, uh, to direct outcome and then with a human decided objective function, uh, trains it on large quantities of data. And that practice, I think, will become dominant in the next five to 10 years for many, many other domains. Now, you will also hear from other scientists in AI that they also think things like reinforcement learning, uh, transfer learning, and many other things have potential, multi-agent learning. But I think this methodology that I just described I think will, is now catching on and will become a mainstream. And I would suggest that as a freshman, it's time to download some uh, the latest TensorFlow and make sure you're on top of how to use it. Thank you. Uh, yes, at the front. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for, your, for, uh, for sharing your journey with us. Uh, it's, it's amazing. Um, I have a question. In your opinion, what should governments do today or maybe in the future to make the transition to AI smoother and less painful process? Hmm. Okay. <coughs> um, I, I, I think governments should understand the security issues because that's pervasive and it's universal and try to uh, ensure that is looked after. I also think the jobs problem are huge and that governments should think about how to deal with the, the job issue. Uh, very few governments are thinking about it, probably because most governments are advised by economists rather than computer scientists. <laughs> uh, but I think there is imminent danger when we start seeing you know, 10, 15% of the jobs uh, being, being affected. And for example, as you know, in China, uh, are you from China? No, no? Oh, sorry. In Ch well, I will just tell you, in China, there is a big movement called Mass Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program. And that is pushing everybody to think about, can I be an entrepreneur? And people are thinking about technical for primarily. But I feel there should be programs that go towards more um, social entrepreneurship, how to create jobs of compassion that will have economic uh, impact, will make money, but are, do not have uh, making the most money as its only objective. I think we need to invent something for such social entrepreneurship because these jobs that I described that will bring satisfaction and AI cannot replicate, uh, they are okay paying jobs, they are okay companies, but they're not companies that venture capitalists today would fund because they're sort of uh, break even, slightly profitable, employ tens of thousands types of uh, companies. So how do countries uh, help create these types of companies, not just more Google and Facebook? Uh, that's something I think governments should do. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. Hi, thank you for your speech. Um, Sahil, first year at CATS. Um, I wanted to ask, unlike any previous sort of revolutions where like for example in the dot-com bubble, any uh, clever guy in his garage could uh, make the next big thing, um, AI is unique in that it requires access to huge amounts of data, so much of the research remains exclusive to large multinationals like Google, etc. What do you think are the dangers of um, this powerful tool only remaining in the hands of these like very few select companies that have access to large amounts of data needed to do AI research? Hmm. Uh, very good question. This is related to my point, I think, about um, the haves and have-nots. And the haves are the Googles of the world who have um, uh, a huge percentage of the world's top AI scientists, uh, who have more data than uh, thousands of companies combined, uh, who have more computers than thousands of companies combined. So this cyclic um, reinforcement of the stronger companies to get even stronger is in fact um, a challenge. 
Uh, not that Google is doing anything wrong, it's just behaving like any public company would by maximizing its profits. And, um, <coughs> and I think what the world really needs is to really let many types of AI proliferate. See, if all we think about is internet AI, then Google and Facebook and Amazon will always dominate because they have such a strong position and usership today. But if we start thinking about my layer two, wave two, three, and four, if we start thinking about how do we let the automotive companies, how do we let the retail stores, the hospitals, the uh, schools, how do we let the banks and insurance companies all get into AI, uh, those are areas where a Google or Facebook cannot so much leverage their data advantage and that new great companies would be created. So I think um, uh, uh, more, more people should think about applying AI to areas that are outside the internet giants, uh, partly because that's where the greatest value resides, and partly that's where you don't get squashed. Um, so, so I think uh, there will be um, uh, many, uh, if we look at the whole, this whole room as all the opportunities, as big as Google is, it might just be the size of this uh, uh, lecture stand. Uh, there are so many other places where people can find uh, new entrepreneur opportunities. And I think it's that spirit of entrepreneurship, looking everywhere for those opportunities, finding those where the giants cannot exert their monopoly status, uh, that will make hundreds of AI companies. And I think if there are hundreds of great AI companies through competition, we can probably keep them more in check. Thank you. Um, at the top, yes. Is there a microphone there? Yeah. Hi. Uh, just following up on that, do you think AI will increase the power of the state as well, and potentially whether that's an issue? And also, is there a resource problem underlying all this talk about autonomous cars and AI, the fact that China has a lot of the resources, the raw materials required for it? Um, is it sustainable in that sense? I was just wondering. Okay. Uh, sorry, the second part is, why do you think China has all the resources? I didn't get that. Well, or generally, are we actually thinking about the sustainability issues of developing autonomous cars and AI generally? Like, the, the uh, raw materials for the chips in particular are in quite short supply, I believe. I'm not entirely sure, but I was wondering whether you could elaborate on that. Uh, sorry, what, what are the shortages? <laughs> uh, so, well, I believe that only a certain number of countries have the raw materials that actually go into oh. making the chips oh, and okay. generally AI technology. I see. Uh, okay, so in terms of uh, technology uh, uh, capabilities, I think U.S. currently through its semiconductor industry is probably the most powerful. So pro probably not, not, not China. Uh, in terms of data, I think China has more, but I don't think we're at a stage where any uh, one, one country is going to, uh, to to dominate everyone else. And you had another. Uh, is this on? Whether it increases the power of the state? Power of the state. Yeah. Right. Very interesting question. I think this. Uh, I can only speculate. Obviously, a government can use AI um, to uh, for. To, to ensure the safety of its citizens, um, for increased surveillance, uh, you know, s RoboCop, if you will. Uh, but the RoboCop does not look like a killer robot with guns, but, uh, but it might actually look like a bunch of cameras in airports and train stations that are watching for terrorists and criminals and causing people to go question those that uh, might be on the most wanted list. So I think we can see governments using AI uh, obviously, it could be for good as well as not good, um, but, uh, but I think uh, governments are going to be using more AI, and hopefully, mostly for good. Um, but you will see in a lot of uh, science fiction novels, another interesting issue is corporations sometimes become even more powerful than governments. Um, this, this I'm a little bit sympathetic to from the science fiction standpoint, because corporations have their act together. Uh, they they really can, can uh, iterate and gather and optimize. We gave examples of that. So, um, 
So I think how governments will manage corporations will be a very interesting challenge because uh, today I think Google knows more about American citizens than the U.S. government does. <laughs> so how will U.S. government um, uh, manage Google uh, or work with Google going forward? I think that's perhaps a more interesting question I'd be, I'm curious about. Thank you. Uh, yes, at the front here. Do you have a microphone? Thanks. Um, thank you very much. I'm very excited to see you here. I have watched a lot of videos in the past <laughs> and read the books. I feel like a movie star in the previous uh, <laughs> that you've had here. So I'm very excited. I you guys didn't know I perform in music videos, right? <laughs> Um, I have two questions, yes. very short one. The first one is, uh, why do you decide to come, come to Cambridge? Because I know that uh, you are very busy and uh, you decide to come this year and uh, maybe some special reason. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and uh, um, also I think uh, uh, for Chinese, there's a lot of great speakers, but they are underrepresented sometimes in um, English university. So I want to find out uh, how we can invite and to have more presentations from the great speaker. Oh, from like more Chinese you. speakers? Like you. <laughs> Asian speakers, okay. Uh, well, I, I'm here in the UK for a week and um, uh, one of the things I saw that was important for me to learn is the very advanced artificial intelligence programs at a number of um, UK universities. So I'm, I'm coming to several of them and speaking at several other universities as well. Uh, it's hopefully a chance for me to create a connection uh, with the computer science machine learning faculty and also with the students who might be interested in working with us in, um, in, the future, in exploring the future of AI. So, uh, so that's the main purpose of, of this trip to, to the UK and Cambridge. This is actually the first time I have given a talk, and, and uh, it's, it's a lot of fun, and I hope to come back. Um, in terms of how to invite more Asian speakers, as an example, uh, Har Harvard has a um, China business forum, and that has become a huge institution in the United States. And it's student organized, and, uh, and, and they fly in uh, probably several dozen top Chinese business people to speak at that forum. So if the students here want that, I'm sure you can organize a similar forum. Uh, uh, I personally have not been to the China Harvard Business Forum, <laughs> but, uh, but <laughs> many, of, many of my friends have. So I think, I think um, uh, Cambridge certainly has that attraction. And uh, the, I think the reason Harvard has been successful is that it actually uh, uh, partner with other universities uh, as opposed to compete with them in creating that forum. So maybe something to study. Thank you very much. Thank and you. Good question. <laughs> is, uh, recently there's uh, a very scary news about uh, Amazon is going to take over the world and, uh, um, and Jeff Bezos becomes the richest person possible in the modern history. And I'm just wondering, do you agree? What's your take on this? And if uh, <coughs> there's other competitors like Google or Alibaba even, mm. is there anything they can do to balance this game? Where did you read that story? <laughs> <coughs> Probably New York Times. New York Times, okay. <coughs> well, uh, certainly Jeff has become the richest uh, person uh, for now. And I think uh, he is probably the, the best uh, entrepreneur and uh, leader in the corporate, technical corporate world um, because he has that balance of understanding technology and going, uh, thinking ahead of the curve. And I think that's what's led Amazon, one generation of product after another, to be a surprise to the world. And I think he also has something very admirable, which is not to become a uh, fall prey to the Wall, Street, the Wall Street expectations. So he's very willing to lose more money as long as he's doing the right thing. And he has earned, I think, a lot of respect and trust in the Wall Street and his success is well deserved. Having said that, I think Amazon has a lot of weaknesses as well. Uh, I think Amazon's uh, research capabilities are uh, quite abysmal compared to uh, a Google, Facebook, Baidu, 
or Alibaba. Uh, it is not a place known for research excellence, and I think that is a potential potential issue uh, for the company going going forward. Um, also, I think um, as advanced as you think about Amazon Go and acquiring of Whole Food, um, just wait till you see what we're doing in China. Um, <laughs> we're going to reinvent, uh, I don't have time to go into a lot of details here, but I would encourage you, I think it's still on the, on the, on the newsstand. Uh, this year's, uh, last year's last Economist, where I wrote a piece on OMO, it's online merging with offline. And I believe the Chinese thinking behind online offline merging is no less advanced than Jeff Bezos. So we will definitely give him a run for his money. Thank you. Uh, we've got time for one more question. Um, yes, just here. Thank you very much for your talk. So my question is, even though China made lots of progress in kind of IT product or AI product, uh, but it's mainly regionally restricted within great China areas or by Chinese users, vice versa. Like for example, my company, we had great technology developed in, within this university, but we had difficulties entering the Chinese market. How do you think in future this barrier can be smoothed or mm. can be Im improved? Mm. Okay. <clears throat> I think this barrier will um, only grow, not shrink. I'm sorry to, sh to tell you that. Um, <laughs> but, but it isn't a government restriction that I'm thinking about. I know many of you think that, but it isn't that. It's actually um, China and the, the Western world have become parallel universes. And the, the cost of taking a product from one university to another is become increasing uh, over time. Just to give you a very simple example, if you build an app, right, you can promote it here by using um, Facebook, Pinterest, um, uh, Snapchat, or whatever it is you guys use here. Um, but if you are in China, you gotta figure out how to promote using WeChat. And the very way of promoting using WeChat is completely different from how you promote using the Western platforms. So how many companies can really run two growth hacking teams doing completely different things? That's really hard. And also the Chinese um, stack, or the you know, different types of technologies riding on each other, are completely different from the West, right? Rather than AWS, there's uh, Ali Cloud. Uh, rather than uh, having a PayPal, there's uh, the, the, the Tencent Pay and then the Alipay, which uh, don't interoperate and have all kinds of uh, challenges. And then on, on, on top, the social fabric is different. And then American companies tend to be single play. Facebook is just a platform, no content. I mean, no, no vertical, no games, no content. Tencent will do everything, right? So, <laughs> so as an entrepreneur, if you gotta manage two completely different ecosystems, stacks, and software, and capabilities, and deal with users who have completely different habits of using, usage, it's just incredibly hard. I'll give you another example. You know, you guys, many of you guys probably think China's rampant with piracy and nobody pays for software. Well, that completely turned in the last three years. Now the Chinese people are paying a lot more than, than you guys here. The Chinese people are paying for, you know, voice question answering, knowledge sharing, right? There are a number of companies in China called, uh, you know, De Dao, uh, Zhihu, Qingting FM, and uh, Himalaya, they're doing things that are unheard of here. And these are great ways to promote yourself using these type of knowledge market and economy. So I'm, in short, what I'm saying is, if you look at the uh, sort of American software stack and the Chinese, they're so different. So an entrepreneur going cross market is just incredibly difficult. So I think um, what, on the other hand, there are probably some companies that can do better than others. So let's say you're merely a e-commerce seller of a certain product. That you're okay. You can sell on uh, Tmall and Amazon, right? That should be okay. If you're a technology company and your technology is great, uh, let's say you have a, you know autonomous vehicle car uh, um, part, let's say a, a, a LiDAR or, or a particular chip, well, certainly you can sell that in US uh, and, and, and China. So, and, and some things, 
And, and there are a few things that are somewhat universal. I think gaming is reasonably universal. Uh, entertainment uh, is reasonably universal. So I think the parts that can span China and non-China are those things, technology, entertainment, uh, e-commerce. And if you really want to build an app or build a, an infrastructure, I'm afraid the parallel universes are drifting further apart, not closing in together. Thank you. Um, we'll have to end there with the questions, okay. but uh, hopefully you will join me uh, in giving Dr. Lee a huge round of applause and thank you. <laughs> Um, as, I, as I said briefly in the questions, tomorrow night we're hosting uh, our first debate of term. This house fears the mass adoption of driverless cars. Speakers will include the CEO of Aston Martin, the chief engineer of Jaguar Land Rover, several very important lawyers, academics and professors. It promises to be incredibly interesting. So if anyone would like to come, please uh, feel free to show up tomorrow here at 7.30. Uh, for something a little bit different. Uh, finally, afterwards in the bar for about 20, 25 minutes, um, anybody interested in artificial intelligence or anything that Dr. Lee has spoken about um, will be welcome to meet us and meet him uh, in the bar afterwards uh, for a short while. So thank you very much, and we'll see you there.